okay uh thank you everyone uh for being a part of this uh, very very happy to have everyone join today and uh, really excited for the showcase so again uh, a big uh, thanks and a token of appreciation very quickly a uh, round of uh, introductions for uh, the speakers today uh, my name is nardeep singh i am a part of uh, cap gemini's insights and data group uh, and basically with we we deal with all things uh, data right i've been a part of uh, cap gemini for close to 2 and a half years now uh, i'm based out of toronto canada uh, and and i'm really really happy to be a part of uh, you know the, 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 this company uh, lots of uh, innovative stuff that is going on across industries and domains and and we'll uh, talk more today over to you george thank you yep thanks nardeep yeah, my name is george kobar and i am a uh, community advocate for elastic and i've been uh, at Elastic for about three and a half years in, in different roles uh, within Elastic uh, from support into uh, community and you know, developer relations and advocacy. And prior to that, um, working with a lot of practitioners, um, both um, from a consulting, training, um, supporting um, support and architecture. So have a, a, a a pretty broad um, experience within the um, technical world. And I'm very happy to, to be presenting to, to everyone here uh, about uh, Elasticsearch observability and uh, some values behind that. And, uh, you know, I'm based in uh, Colorado, so uh, a little south uh, from Nardeep's location. <laughs> well, south and east, I guess, so. And hotter. Yes, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> okay, thanks, George. Uh, quickly going over the agenda slide for today, right? So we'll go through the introduction, uh, Capgemini's company overview very briefly. We'll talk about uh, why we have gathered here today, right? What is the problem statement as far as observability or end-to-end -end monitoring, like, like I want to call it, is concerned. And when I talk about end-to-end -end monitoring, it's both in, in a cloud-based environment or, or an on-premise environment. And when I say end-to-end, -end, it could be monitoring for data related to logs, like uh, web logs, application logs, infrastructure-related logs, or something like CPU utilization or network or storage, uptime, or, or even business data, right? Basically, everything under the sun when we talk about modern architectures and applications set up and what observability means for, for that. Then we'll quickly uh, move to Elastic's of observability solution. Uh, George will go over uh, some of the uh, nitty gritties of you know how the solution looks like, and then he is going to uh, give us a quick demo showcase for which I am particularly excited. And then we'll have a small Q and A to round off things. All right. Okay, talking about uh, Cap Gemini, right? Uh, it started in 1967. Uh, with only seven folks out of uh, France. Uh, I'm sure they did not live in uh, this, this uh, the, 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 the building that you see uh, <laughs> nowadays. I'm pretty sure they did not uh, start this way. But yeah, as of 2019, uh, Capgemini has become a global leader uh, when we talk about uh, information technology, consulting and uh, services play. We have close to uh, 210,000 uh, plus employees uh, still counting. Uh, we have a presence in uh, 44 countries and our 2019 uh, revenue was about 13.2 uh, billion euros. We have 25 innovation centers, uh, what we, uh, we, we, we like to call them as uh, applied innovation exchange centers. And I'll talk uh, briefly about uh, that as well uh, in, in the next few slides or so. And, uh, and when we talk of, about clients across industries and domains, uh, the overall number is close to 6,000 plus. Specifically now talking about uh, Capgemini Financial Services, um, some, some um, you know, pretty impressive data points there. Our clients, uh, nine out of uh, the top 15 banks that we service, uh, 12 out of the top uh, 15 investment banks. Uh, similarly, um, in, uh, within the insurance domain as well, we work closely with uh, 12 out of uh, the top 15 insurance companies. And, and when we uh, 
become a strategic partner of of these companies uh it's it's both for uh you know traditional work also uh, the work that is is considered more digital in nature right and when i talk digital it could be related to cloud uh, data and analytics iot so basically a best of uh, uh, both the worlds right uh, we have a strong domain focus as well uh, when you talk about insurance uh, be it pnc life or health insurance uh, when you talk about banking uh, we have a presence in uh, pretty much all the spheres of banking be it retail commercial cards and payments uh, capital markets or or wealth management uh and again as i said when we talk about uh, uh, capabilities uh we we focus both on traditional and new age services so that you know you you get an end to end offering uh, uh, uh in 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 uh, all your uh, territories uh the way we like to engage with customers is 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 a very collaborative experience right as i said we uh work out of sometimes uh, we uh, uh, centers which are called as applied innovation exchange centers we have close to 25 such centers which are spread uh, worldwide and and when typically when we onboard a client we like to do small demo showcases or pocs based out of those uh, uh, exchange centers as well so that that makes the whole engagement a lot more interactive and agile right moving on to the next slide uh this talks about uh, the the global business line uh, which i'm a part of within cap gemini right insights and data and and we we do stuff uh, or uh, you know 100% coverage for everything that is related to data be it uh, data estate modernization uh, including cloud data management or even legacy migration uh, be it related to security or trust uh, data operations data quality uh, mdm data governance or or even the, the 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 new buzzwords that you keep hearing right uh, ai machine learning uh, security data engineering and even augmented uh, analytics uh, some more uh, data points about uh, the the global business line i i'm talking about insights and data right uh, gartner's uh, 2019 magic quadrant places cap gemini uh, as as a leader uh, for for the third year, uh, year in a row even the everest uh, ratings uh, we we are a leader as far as the data and analytics space is concerned uh, both in 2019 and 2020 and you see the nelson hall data point there as well again uh, cap gemini is a leader in in the advanced analytics space so that was all about uh, you know a, a company overview of cap gemini now talking about uh, the the problem statement uh, that we are going to discuss today uh, the power of uh, observability uh, so when we talk about end to end monitoring uh, you know both in a cloud and an on premise environment uh, we've seen that uh, software delivery and implementation development has gone through a lot of changes uh, specifically in the last 2 or 3 years right due to um, the the advent and great adoption of of cloud what we have seen is that there has been a greater focus of moving away from uh, monolithic services to something like microservices right um there has been greater focus on ci cd which is of course a continuous integration and continuous development um there's a greater focus on container based uh, solutions or even serverless applications right if you, if you talk about uh, the aws cloud you have lambda if you talk about microsoft azure you have functions so basically serverless computing has also come into the picture in in a big manner so strategically what that means is that system observability is a lot more challenging and critical than ever before right there are so many pieces that you need to look at so many technology stacks independent service providers that you are integrating in your cloud or your on premise environment that the view the final view that you want to obtain can be very complex right and it could look something like this right scary too many dashboards 
uh, showing too many data points again bringing in a, a great deal of complexity um you have one tool that is monitoring uh, something like logs you have another tool for for some infrastructure related activities and you could have a third tool for for business data and and putting together those dashboards and visualizations for a business analyst is is a lot tougher than than it used to be right and i specifically have a data point actually for all this and according to you know a survey 65% of the organizations have close to 10 plus monitoring tools so there you go right uh, needless to say this is a, a lot of uh, complex uh, this brings a lot of complexity in the, in the overall environment and uh, as i showed a lot of uh, dashboards uh, to look at what are the other challenges that we have uh, uh, you know heard from our customers customers um even if you you have a variety of tools uh, you see that uh, you know they 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 run into cost challenges uh, plus the tools are closed source in nature and they are not keeping pace with with the with with how the cloud architecture or cloud technology is evolving pricing models are also at ad, or at odds with the modern architectures and it's 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 very complex to understand uh, you know how pricing works in 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 some of these tools enter elastic right so so what we are saying is that elastic has a ready made offering so to speak for uh, overcoming some and more of of these challenges and i'll uh, invite uh, george to talk more about it over to you george thank you yeah thanks nardi so the uh what's what's really you know i think about the history of of monitoring system and devices you know kind of looking at that screen prior um with all of the different dashboards and different components you know like that that used to work with a lot of bare metal applications you know when we kind of think of pets versus cattle and i i'm sure that's an analogy that's been in this industry for at least the last 5 years where we treated our applications more like pets where we you know take uh, great care of them we you know nurture them we uh, you know specialize that that's kind of where we have a lot of these monolithic apps um and of course with the microservices or uh serverless technologies you know they're more like cattle it's it's something obviously we we still feed and nurture and, and so forth but i think that becomes a lot um uh that becomes a lot more apparent that you have a lot more systems to take care of um could you advance the next uh, slide please So when we kind of look at that that terminology um is is really and what we'll showcase in the uh, the demo today is why uh do uh from an elastics perspective for observability why should you look for our open source or our our solution for for observability um it really comes down to differentiated technology that's within your um current uh space within your e-commerce space or uh architectures right um we also have uh, a lot of these solutions the core pieces that we'll be talking about today which are you know beats which are bringing data into elastic search uh to agents that are doing the observability or the um application performance monitoring and the uh logging information uh, as we ingest that data into elastic search and visualize that data through kibana this is a all open source technology and not only is it open source um you know there's a, a huge community that that surrounds this uh, technology um and obviously you know being elastic is the creators of the software we have control over you know the features bug enhancements or uh feature enhancements uh, uh fixes and bugs and of course you know, we have a lot of uh great open source community and also uh customers that help uh contribute and you know we all uh, have a very centralized pricing model right it's only the data that you use that is on the elastic cluster itself so there's there's no how many agents you have or there's no how many different pieces of technology um that have integrate and and so forth it's just a very simple model that you can that you can look at uh could you change slides please So and what Nardeep was talking about having these different tools or 10 plus tools um if we kind of look at today's 
uh, observability stack for most organizations, you'll have a tool for, let's say, the operations team that's looking at logs. And you might have another tool for the operations team to be using infrastructure monitoring. And the development team, either through the development process or even uh, monitoring, has another tool to, to view uh, application performance monitoring or uh, open tracing. Um, and another team that does uh, service monitoring, let's say the NOC team that's looking at um, you know, performance. And, and of course, on top of that, uh, there may be a separate business KPI uh, tool for that. And, and that's what we see is we see a lot of these silos across these multiple technical teams. And if it's, uh, when you have an issue, it's difficult to go to another team because they're not looking at the same data. They're not looking at the same pieces that you have. Um, you might have to lose another tool that you're not really familiar with, or they're sh they may share information with you um, that uh, it's difficult for, for them to really ingest or really understand. Uh, next slide. So really the approach to our uh, Elastics observability is to unify all of these teams with just a single source of truth. And that is just the data. Um, you know, we're collecting all this data. Uh, all these tools are being used to collect different logs, metrics, traces, and business KPI information. And it's stored somewhere as data, whether it be, you know, a different format. You know, Elasticsearch doesn't care in which format it, it's in. You know, we take that, ingest that data into Elasticsearch in the form of JSON documents, and we have one single truth. So rather than having a different tool for all these different pieces, what we're doing is we're saying that you're having the same single data source and Elasticsearch being as a fast search engine and Kamada to be able to visualize this data, you can have multiple teams looking at maybe different dashboards, but the same product, the same solution. So if you are looking at metrics, you could easily see that, uh, that maybe there might be a correlation with logs or you're looking at traces. So having the same language, that same common schema across all of your data sources and all of your teams makes that resolution to, to, to resolving issues a lot quicker. And we'll actually also talk about how you can also enrich this data and drive the, the value even more by incorporating a lot of uh, business KPI data. Uh, next slide. So Again, we're not really, we're looking at breaking down all of these silos um, and really unifying all of these pieces together. So it's really just all this data happens to, to be ingested into Elasticsearch and Kibana be able to visualize that data. So you can um, spot issues earlier. We'll talk about our machine learning um, in action, um, alerting uh, unified dashboards. So there's no multiple different tools to log in and a different dashboard to interpret. It's all the same. And you'll see an example just in the next slide. And again, it's one pricing model and really one uh, tool to learn, secure, and maintain the entire environment. So observability is just one of the use cases a lot of people use Elasticsearch for. A lot of other people are using Elasticsearch for as, as part of their SIM or security or uh, as a part of their application search or as a part of a search application. So there's a lot of different use cases that are just um, used on the core Elasticsearch or the Elastic stack. Uh, next slide. Thank you. And this is just a great, and I'll show you a live dashboard uh, of this, but this is kind of our approach. If you take a look and layer, you know, what we consider to be the three pillars of observability, logs, metrics, and APM or traces, you can, um, from different teams, be able to take a high level view of these different pieces together and be able to formulate that um, into uh, a story, uh, something that could easily uh, locate fine issues or prevent issues, or from a business KPI standpoint, understanding where are those points of, of breaking and if those uh, different components within microservices architecture or serverless, you know, what's the cost of that? What, you know, how can we do to improve that? And I think this is probably a great point uh, for me to go ahead and, and show you this. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen in just a second. Let's see here. Thank you. And let me, uh, let me just share my screen as soon as I can find the... Perfect. And let me know if for whatever reason you, you can't see my, my, my area. But... When we talk about uh, observability, you know, one thing that um, I want to do is, is kind of showcase uh, uh, or, or walk you through maybe a scenario we'll call for observability. 
And for this demo, what we've done is, um, you know, uh, we've created a, a company called Hipster Incorporated. And this Hipster Incorporated uh, company sells uh, different vintage or uh, hipster uh, products, right? And, and this particular uh, demonstration here for this e-commerce platform is uh, fully functional. It's something that if I wanna buy vintage cameras, I can select right on it and I can go ahead and add to cart. Now, Hipster Incorporated, they, there are a, they don't have any brick and mortar stores. So their entire um, revenue is based upon a uh, digital experience. And that digital experience is, is not only just in performance, but uptime, making sure that this application is available at all times. And it's important because obviously we've heard where people, uh, you know, outages during holiday season costing millions of dollars, right? And, and, and or lost opportunities, let's say, for marketing campaigns or sales. Um, so there's a lot of inter, inter, integrations and a reliance upon a digital experience. And you have to think about um, if you put yourselves in the reliability um, SRE or uh, observability teams um, or operations teams, their, their goal solely is to make sure that, you know, they avoid issues or they resolve the issues as quickly as possible. And as, as Nardeep showed earlier, that these modern application architectures are just becoming a lot more complex. And, and as they're becoming a lot more complex, it's becoming a lot more harder to, to resolve these issues. So for this particular um, uh, web application, I do wanna share the, um, the architecture with you to kind of really get an idea of, of, of how this is built. And this is built using a, a 10 tier microservices application. And you'll notice here that we have um, our APM um, uh, agent or metric bead, which is a lightweight uh, agent as well that, that sits on the host. And this microservices application um, is, uh, is programmed across many different languages like C++, C plus, uh, or excuse me, C Sharp or Go or uh, Java, Node.js. And you'll notice they're using uh, Redis cache here. So this environment not only is um, on a Kubernetes environment that's on uh, GCP, but it's using a lot of heterogeneous um, programming languages. And, and, you know, you hear a lot of people say, hey, I'm in a Java or a .NET or let's say a Python shop, right? Well, the, the truth of reality is a lot of these modern day applications that are either on a, on a phone or, or just through the, through the web, you know, they're really pieced in, uh, together using different components. And that's why uh, Hipster Incorporated uh, decided to use this uh, as a part of their observability because Elastic has the uh, unique ability to handle these unique uh, cloud native architectures being serverless and, and over containers um, and, and Kubernetes. And they also are able to, to trace and monitor a lot of these heterogeneous uh, programmed um, application pieces like Python, Go, uh, Java, .net, uh, Java, um, .net, Node.js, right? A lot of these pieces were able to monitor. And one of the critical pieces of observing is being able to fit in with some of the common workflows that you already do today. So we think about, we don't want to, what type of new tool and or to process that you have to integrate. Now we integrate with a lot of tools that handle cases or uh, being alerting. And let me walk you through a, a basic scenario of, you know, from an alert and understanding what we're bringing to the table by unifying all the data to one data source. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into our um, day alert here. And as an example here, um, you know, uh, we received a, an alert. Um, so a part of our uh, machine learning, it's an unsupervised machine learning, it detected anomaly. And it detected that there was a high mean transaction duration for the Advit service. And what it did is it sent uh, a notification to me over Slack. So what I could do is I can actually select right onto this alert and it'll take me over to a service map. Now, if you notice on the service map and hopefully uh, the, the, uh, the view here is, is okay. The, you know, it's not too small on everyone's screen. Um, if it is just uh, mentioned in chat, but the, what's important about the service map, it maps directly to that architecture map that we have, right? We can kind of see how some of these different services are really integrated together. Well, within the service map, uh, this is automatically building a mapping of how all these services are really interconnected. So we got an alert on the Advit service that's having issues. So if you kind of take a look at this Advit service, we see you know this red ring around it that there's some issues here. And um, we also can kind of see, hey, there might be issues with the front end. And if we kind of highlight over the front end, we can see all these different connection points. 
the front end connects to the cart service, the advert service, the currency service, the shipping service, all these different services. But since we got the alert on the advert service, if I click on this, this kind of gives us a little detail of what the anomaly was. You know, where um, we can look at the transaction duration, what was the CPU memory, and we can actually look through the service de details we want. But first, I want to take a look at the anomalies. This is that machine learning, um, unsupervised learning that, that's going on. And, and machine learning is, is a loaded term, right? Or AI is, is a loaded term. But really what we're doing is we're using the, uh, we're doing unsupervised learning that's understanding the environment. What are the, the highs and the lows? And we can kind of see that here. Um, this blue is represented what the, the, the average high and low is over a period of time. And we can kind of see some spikes here of anomaly score. Um, and we can also see that, hey, it looks like um, from, from this view, we have some annotations here. We have some of our operations folks uh, go ahead and label this. It looks like this was addressed, um, and I think uh, this is 5 a.m. local their time, but this was uh, from the universal coordinated time, or UTC. This was about uh, midnight at 18. And someone said, hey, they probably got woken up. Yep, I know, I, I acknowledged it. It was kind of a spike. You know, it's gone down. They can see where th that's an issue. But then later on, we see that there was another spike and someone else notated that, hey, we see another spike. I'm going to go ahead and just redeploy, right? And that was about 30 minutes later. And then this is the new alert that we got, right? The anomaly score was 81. This is higher. And we definitely see a trend here of the, the different pieces here. So by restarting or by redeploying the application um, uh, from the, you know, Kubernetes, this is not a, it doesn't really appear to be an issue specifically to the containers they're running on, or maybe the host that we're on, right? This very well could be something with the application, or at least something we have to investigate further, right? And so we kind of take a look at some of the anomaly scores. If we drill down here, we get a lot more information about what's the typical um, transaction duration we see, but what was the actual? And what's the probability that this is an actual anomaly? You know, of course, you don't want to get alerted on any type of anomaly, but the higher the spike, that's why you'll, you'll get these notifications. But what do you do with this data that you get an anomaly or you get this machine learning? Well, you can start to investigate uh, what the possible issues could be. So under the actions right here on the right-hand side, I'm going to click that and I'm going to look at the APM service part, the actual advert service that we're, um, we're monitoring. And looking at the service map, we can see that, um, you know, uh, how much time is spent by, uh, time spent by each different uh, span type. Most of the span time, there's a lot of uh, Elasticsearch data being used, um, some app data, and also, um, you know, very little uh, dips here. You know, and right around the times we're probably having some issues, we can kind of see some correlations here. But really, if we look at the transactions, that's really what they gave us the alert was the mean transaction time. We can definitely see that there, is, there are some, there are huge spikes in this area here. And then as we go along, these are, you know, this is where the first acknowledgement was. This is another time when there was a redeploy and of course this is larger. So we can actually see some correlations in the data. And we're just looking at the trace portion of this. You know, and if we, if we actually look into the transaction type, we can start to take a look at the, um, the spans. How long is it taking uh, for, span, uh, for a transaction span to take? And this is a nice little graph that shows you the distribution of that. Right, so most of these transactions take between 100 to 200 milliseconds or 200 to 300 milliseconds. But we see some evidence on this side that, that you know, some requests can take to 1600 or, or 1700 milliseconds. Right, so we can kind of go into what's the typical trace. And we also can look at the trace that's causing the issues. So if we take a look at the uh, a full trace here, we can see if we're, we're finding any errors or anything else that we can find within the trace. And lo and behold, within this, um, you know, transaction here, there, er, there is an error message. And if we actually click on the error, it'll take us, uh, fail to get ads, deadline exceeded, um, context, uh, context deadline exceeded. That means, you know, the, the, the time that it, the advert service was trying to fetch data, the, it exceeded the normal timeout. And that doesn't give you a clear indication of what could be happening or why this man transactions are taking a lot longer. But it actually go into the error code itself, we can actually get the ex uh, exception code message. Right, and actually what's also great for the development team is to be able to get this stack trace and look at some of the library frames, the actual code. Um, and I believe this is in, uh, written in, it might be in Java, it might be Go. Actually, it's written in Java and the icon under the service map will, will, will tell us. 
But by looking at all of this, um, the code, we can actually say if there was an actual issue with uh, the code, this is something as the operations team or whoever else is monitoring this, you can copy this information um, and, and, and give this right to the development team for them to investigate. So, you know, looking at this, is it's a deadline exceeded. It's, a, it's an exception that took too long for that. So I don't think this is necessarily a code issue, but quickly we're able to see, okay, looking at this, it looks like it's just a lot longer to, to grab data from the front end service. Um, what else could it be? Um, and that's kind of where the power of this observability is. We, we just kind of eliminated the traces. Well, let's take a look at the logs and let's take a look at the metrics and see if there's anything else we could find, right? So one thing you could do um, if we come back over to our, um, um, to our, well, actually to our screen here, um, we could start to investigate, um, you know, a dashboard. So let's, you know, take a look at the dashboard and see what we could find. Uh, we could start to build our own dashboards using the lens. You know, but if I come over, let's say to um, observability, and I want to take a look at the um, the logs, for example, this is something I can I can dive right into. You know, and what's nice about the this logs here is that as the logs that you're sending in, if you know it's the front end service, you could actually type in, for example, what host it's on. Um, so host name, for example, um, and then you can type in the actual host name. And then it'll pull only logs for that host name for as part of that transaction. Um, you know, in the days of, of me personally uh, troubleshooting systems, you know, I'd, I'd jump, do a, a, an SSH into a host or uh, using a DRAC system like, um, and do a, uh, some KVM into the, and then slowly typing because, you know, you could duplicate keys, right? But basically what I want to do is get to the logs and do like a tail dash F if there's some type of live data or event that's going on right now. That's something you could easily do from here and just hit uh, streaming live. Now there's no data that we have live streaming for this particular demo. So it'll probably, oh, we'll see what happens here. Yeah, actually, so it's updating about one second ago, two seconds ago, but this is all the data that we're grabbing um, from our environment. Now, again, I haven't narrowed it down by that agent, but that's something I could easily do. Um, but I could see, you know, different also, has the log rate spiked? Have I seen, where the logs have, have increased over a period of time. And we know that the error message was from, uh, from this, failed to get ads. We can actually start to look through uh, this data here to see if there's anything that we can correlate with the logs. Well, in the interest of time, you know, we, there's nothing really in the log that gives us any clues of what could be going on. You know, this might be an issue with, um, you know, my thinking at this point, you know, again, looking through the logs is, there are no log messages that have like a, a fail message or so forth. Um, you know, but we, we could indicate that there might be some heap issues or some memory issues or something on the infrastructure. So now is a good time for us to kind of take a look at this from an infrastructure perspective. So again, I'm not going to a different tool. I'm getting to a different screen. I'm actually just going to observability and selecting metrics and it's taking me to, uh, uh, to a different screen. And again, you know, one thing that we'll show you here is, is that live view of the, logs, metrics, and APM, and then the business KPI below that to really integrate that together. Now, from the metric side, what we're doing is we're looking at the physical, or excuse me, the hosts that we're monitoring inside Google Cloud. And what we could do is we could look at Kubernetes pods or Docker containers. And this happens to be um, AWS collection. I think that's just our AWS collector. This is not residing on AWS. This is within that GCP. But I'm looking at the Docker containers, and the metric I'm looking for is, is CPU. You know, there might be some containers that kind of show, okay, there is a, a container that has 409% of CPU. That's something, you know, for us to, to, to maybe investigate on. Or maybe if I want to go by memory usage. You know, this is something that I can quickly drill down and look at if there's any containers that are, 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 are having higher than expected um, memory. And, and again, you know, I think by going through, you know, the traces, the monitoring, the, uh, the logs, really quickly narrows down all of the, uh, what could possibly be the issue, rather than sending it to one department and them analyzing the issue and then saying, nope, it's not us. Not, not you're waiting on the network team or you're waiting on the storage team or you're waiting on the application team to really give you an answer to kind of progress this forward. You could have a lot of different teams look at their data or you can, can look at their data at the same time looking together because it's that same unified view. And one thing is, um, this is that viewpoint that we have looking at this live data. You know, this is, this is you know, something that you could take a look at from a dashboard, from a knock, or even from a, a team. 
if you're sharing this teeth, that's, that's really important. But one of the things I really want to share is, so, so what? I mean, it's great that we're going to resolve issues, the, you know, reduce the mean time to resolving problems, right? But what are some things that you can also incorporate with this data? And a lot of people leave this on the table, which is around the business KPIs. And what I mean that is it's, it's the cost transparency that you get from operations, where you can see where not even from an incident perspective, how much are your incidents costing you? Um, are there certain components that are causing more issues versus other issues? Um, is there, you know, if you start looking at trends, um, hey, every time that we're doing a backup or we're, we're, we're observing something, we see a, a drop in sales because we're bringing systems down or whatever method we're doing to, to uh, 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 what we're doing on the back end for our architecture is causing issues. And there's a lot of tools that, ha that are available to you to be able to view some of that data. Now, there's something that's called graph. And a uh, graph is um, an, in Kibana, and it's a way of showing you relationships and data. And by showing you, there's a, if you actually install the open source Elasticsearch in Kibana, um, you know, either through a container or through like a, a cloud trial, um, that has this sample data that you can load in. So this is something that you can play uh, with on your laptop or just through a cloud trial or, or whatever. But I'm going to go ahead and load, um, use this, this graph data to kind of give you some examples on how you can start to correlate some of your business KPIs with your observability. And if I look at this sample data for this e-commerce data, and again, this is something you'll exactly see if you do it yourself, is what we're doing is we're looking at this data set, which is sample e-commerce data. And some of the fields that we selected that's in the index are customer gender, uh, customer gender, GOIP continent name, and product category. And graph, is, the whole purpose around this graph is to show you what are the strongest relationships within your data. So if you took it male, for example, we could see that this line being thicker shows that a lot of male uh, customers or genders are looking at men's shoes and men's clothing. And I know that's very obvious to see, but when you start to look at, and I'll show you an example, how we start to incorporate services and container names and outages, you can say, hey, this component that we have is extremely weak. And it, sometimes the operations teams might already know, hey, this particular service is, you know, let's say Zookeeper or Kafka or, you know, some Elasticsearch component keeps breaking down. And, and operations people might say, hey, yeah, we, we kind of know that because that's an issue. But there might be something that's more sporadic that's kind of hard to see because these services are, are so big. The microservices are complex. Sometimes you need this data in front of your operations folks to really understand some of the business impacts. So looking at this, you know, we can see female, obviously female to women's clothing is very strong, but we can start looking at, hey, maybe there might be some connection between males and maybe for gifts, shopping for women's clothing or females shopping for some of their friends and based on their region. So these are some stories that you can kind of gather around the business KPIs that can really help from gathering that data from operations. So to show you as an example here, um, so we're gonna create a new uh, graph dashboard. So that's something you can kind of do um, by using the data on your own. Um, but anyway, I'm going to select the data source and a lot of this data is coming in from our um, metric feed. So I'm going to go ahead and select metric feed. Metric feed is grabbing all that metric data into, into Elasticsearch and grabbing that. And I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of fields. So let's go ahead and do, um, let's do service, right? So we know that there's a lot of different services that we saw in our service map. So let's see if we can find something like service, um, service name will be one field that we add. Um, and let's go ahead and do, let's say, um, container, um, a container ID, for example, uh, container ID. And let's just kind of start off with, with this. Now, again, container ID might not be the best because container IDs will be constantly changing and so forth. But this kind of gives us an idea just on how this, this uh, graphing can work for part of your KPIs. So we're gonna graph this out. And we automatically see here, kind of looking at this, that there are some different um, containers that are all servicing a, the currency service. And there's not a lot of uh, correlation between one container, let's say, um, doing a um, email service or payment service, right? Let's say there was only one connection point that's, that's linking to one. If that container happens to go down, then, then you'll lose out your, on your payment service. 
right? So you can kind of look at some of the architectures on, on, on where those uh, uh, pieces are sitting, right? But we can start building some of these stories together. Um, let's see here, there's, I, I think we had, and again, these are just fields that are inside the index when you're uploading data into Elasticsearch using the comma schema, which really we haven't talked more about. Um, but again, you know, there's, there's you know, a, lots of different fields for you to choose from. And if you're using that comma schema, really the, the single data source is, you know, is the data. That's the single source of truth, is just the data. And if we're bringing these different data points into Elasticsearch, we're able to search across that. And the common theme would either be time timestamp or by incident um, or by service. So hopefully this kind of gives you a, a, a good way to, to see some of how, how you can start to build some of these KPIs around that. Um, and most of this is just metric data. Then we start introducing, um, you know, other data. We can start bringing metric data with your KPI data as a separate index. So you can kind of start correlating those together. So at this point, um, I want to kind of, um, actually, one other thing, you know, again, by looking through this uh, Abbott service and going to front-end services, you can obviously start to look at some of the service details and, and start to understand what type of um, errors or transactions you're seeing. So this really helps out. I forgot to look at the front-end service, but yeah, we can see all kinds of RPC codes or um, internal uh, fail to charge. So there's, there's a lot of different errors on the front-end side. So that's kind of where we would start to investigate. It wasn't really an operations, uh, like a CPU memory in the world pretty high, but there was for our issue that we're showing you, there were some issues on the front end, but anyway. Um, so hopefully, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here for just a moment. Hopefully this really gives you the, um, the understanding of the power of observability, not from just a mean to resolve, but also starting to enrich some of that data with some more of the business KPIs, the cost transparency, the analysis, starting to look at some of the, the graphs and again, it's not just using that graph to show you relationships of data for investigative purposes, but creating new, uh, new visualizations comparing the two of them. I think it's just adds the, okay, it's great. You have an observability tool, but this provides additional value to the business to really understand from a zero distillery standpoint, you know, what's going on with the environment. So that's kind of the, the, the scope of the, the demo. Um, um, I, I think at this point, Ardeep, do you, um, do you want to open up to, to questions and, uh, or any uh, comments? Absolutely. I think uh, folks uh, should have a lot of questions. Uh, great demo showcase, by the way. I, I have a lot of technical questions of my own, but, <laughs> but that is for a separate conversation altogether. Happy to help, though. Yeah. It looks like someone did ask a question here. Um, let's see here. Uh, what are the auto, uh, auto box capabilities as far as machine, uh, machine learning concerned in the Elk stack? Um, so uh, let me, I'll share my screen um, and briefly kind of show you just the machine learning and creating jobs and so forth. Um, Cause that, I think the machine learning itself um, is one of those components that uh, I think everyone starts off with a great uh, you know, log collection, metric collection, and getting traces in. But then, you know, and visualizing that data really helps out. But I think the really, the, the powerhouse behind that is that machine learning, which is the, you know, uh, unsupervised learning and understanding what's, what's going on. And if I actually go to that, if I go to the, the home screen for uh, Kibana, um, and I, I kind of scroll down to our machine learning here, and this kind of gives you an overview but there's a, a, a great way to kind of getting started and starting to do some uh, anomaly detection on any of these services, right? Have the Advit service, APM, CART services. Uh, we can start looking at the Kubernetes, like if we want to start looking at uh, different scores. But it, it's easy as just, you know, creating a new job. Uh, let's see here, token header. Oh, you know what? Um, that's because it expired here. Hold on. Let's see if I can refresh that. There you go. Yeah, my, my session had timed out. So, but basically, yeah, we can start to, to look at an index that we want to start looking at the machine learning. So I think that the, the, probably the thing we can probably do is look at the APM data. Um, and then, you know, what do we want to do? We want to take a look at like a single metric where we want to say, hey, I just want to uh, look at the APM service and also do just that tra mean transaction. Um, you know, what's the average transaction 
you know, what, what's the impact there? If I want to look at a uh, multi-metric, if I'm looking at, if I want to correlate CPU and memory together, um, or if I want to look at, um, you know, certain metrics that are kind of paired together. We know maybe when this Advent service has issues, there's also correlating high memory. So once we see memory start to creep up, we want to get alerted because we don't want the Advent service to go down. We can maybe address the memory issues first or, or something that we can do to help alleviate the issue. Again, it's not really a root cause analysis. It's how can we triage this so we can keep the Advent service running. Um, and there's a lot of different other um, uh, pieces to the machine learning. Um, so like the population is really detecting, um, I think the best way to describe population is look at the entire data set as a, as, you know, as, as common, all, you know, let's say all containers within this Kubernetes um, uh, platform. And we're looking out just for the outliers outside of the population. You know, like everyone has an average score of, let's say, you know, 30 to 80 well, 30 to 80% CPU, and we use that as our data set. But then um, looking at the, the, if we see anything outside of the population, that's able, uh, um, how you're able to, to apply that. And there's a lot of other categorizations. So that is more supervised learning if you want to introduce that. But if you go into single metric, for example, we can select the, the single metric, and then we can start looking at what type of fields that we want to do. You know, so we're going to use the August 11th uh, from you know, this time range, I, I think this will be fine. If I select next, then I can kind of pick a field I want to do. So, um, you know, what we said, was it uh, uh, transaction? Uh, let's see here, transaction breakdown count, ID, uh, duration count, so mean. So we'll go ahead and put that in. And then, you know, we can start looking at um, the bucket span. And this gives us how much data to analyze to then, um, uh, then to then to, to learn, the unsupervised learn, then to apply on, on the next. And of course, this could stretch out for days or months if you have all that data collected and say, hey, you maybe for the month of May, we've got a really good baseline when everything was running. We're gonna use that as our, our, our bucket. And if we wanna look at some of the sparse data, um, you know, one of the big things about um, uh, observability is uh, seeing those high cardinality fields and understanding that. And that's a way that you can incorporate that with the machine learning piece. Um, but if we, you know, press next, we can kind of give it a job ID. And this is, uh, for example, test. And I think on this environment, actually, um, job nine, and then we can create our own group and then um, next. And then, of course, the validation. Now, for this demo, um, I think this is kind of in a, uh, a stage that I'm be presenting to later. But as I go through the, the validation and then a summary, then it'll start to, to lay out the data for me in that, that uh, machine learning piece. But there's, there's a lot of different types of detections and, and jobs that are already running. Um, it's one of those things you can go to our, I think it's demo.elastic.co and run through some of the jobs that have we, we pre-created for you. So hopefully that kind of really illustrates some of those, that question. Yep, I think it does. Uh, another one for you, George. Uh, what would you say is your strength uh, that would differentiate Elastic from uh, your competitors? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, so if you look at our competitors, they, um, they're, they could be really good at their specific uh, use case. So there's, a, there's not too many observability companies today that are not using Elasticsearch behind the scenes as a part of their observability. Because being that it's an open source uh, search engine, a lot of companies um, use Elasticsearch as their search component. Um, there's only maybe one that I can, maybe two I can think of that aren't. But if you start looking at the observability you know, pieces or people out there, they're using Elasticsearch behind the scenes. Um, I think there's a lot of people that are really good about making that first use case or first hit very you know, quick. Um, you know, which I think you can do that as, as well. Um, there's a lot of videos that I've created on, on kind of getting started and how you can get dash, dashboards created right away. But you'll see a lot of the depth and capabilities and, hey, I really want to look at, for example, the business KPI data. They might be great about collecting uh, traces, metrics, and logs, but they have no ways of correlating some of that KPI data into it that really enriches the data. Um, and I think the depth in some of these um, competitors is really what you're missing out on. 
Um, the next thing is there's no competitor that really looks at how do I add a search bar in my application? Like for, uh, or how do I secure my environment? And how do I observe my environment? All, by the way, could be using the same Elasticsearch cluster, right? So you're not creating different tools, different products for different pieces, right? It's one Elasticsearch cluster that can handle a lot of different use cases. And those are just the three use cases that we're creating, um, you know, turnkey solutions for. If it's something that you want to use uh, or create uh, as an open source tool, you can easily do so. Um, you know, we the solutions I think is just our way of really making the user experience and like a turnkey solution a lot better. But if you want to build your own observability, your own dashboards, your own your own piece, um, you know, we're here to support you from the open source community as well. So I would say from a I'd say from a competitor standpoint, you know, I, there's not too many, I, I don't think there's any competitor that really looks at all the things that we can do, um, you know, from, from that standpoint. And it looks like there's another um, uh, question here. Um, have Capgemini and Elastic collaborated in the past uh, type of implementations? And uh, Nardeep, I think, uh, I think the answer yep. is yes, but do you want to go in more into that? Sure, I can take that. Thanks, George. We have multiple uh, engagements that we have collaborated on. Uh, most of them are ongoing in nature as well. So obviously, we cannot disclose, disclose the name of the client. Uh, but I would say about 80 to 90% of our engagements have been in financial services. One engagement that I can specifically talk about uh, is, is the one I was a part of, right? This was uh, with RBC Royal Bank here in Toronto, Canada. And this was specifically for their uh, real estate uh, business. Uh, they wanted to transform and optimize uh, their real estate management processes uh, to, to bring about uh, operational and cost efficiencies uh, leading to sustainable growth in their uh, global portfolio. And at the core of this trans transformation was Elasticsearch uh, stack uh, being used to, you know, to store index, uh, store index search, analyze and uh, visualize data. So basically, we were uh, uh, targeting all the core use cases uh, that the ELK stack is used for, um, the enterprise-wide search, uh, the APM, uh, basically, you know, re-Christian dead observability that we went through today. And we also used Kibana for a lot of our dashboarding and uh, visualization needs. So, so it, 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 it was, you know, supporting all these three use cases and what Kibana also allows you to do obviously is gather those machine learning insights as well, like, like you showcased, right? When you have the capability to bring all the data onto a single platform, then you need to decide what do you uh, want to do with it? Uh, it, it opens up a, a whole range of possibilities, right? So uh, uh, I would say that machine learning, when it was introduced, uh, I think it was uh, 2016 or early 17, uh, was, was a great addition. And uh, RBC Royal Bank really liked it. And uh, we also had a couple of implementations in that space. So all in all, a great transformation program for uh, that bank, uh, a, a definite success. Uh, also to mention, we do have a specific elastic uh, center of excellence. Uh, that is a team based out of India. And uh, we, we do, you know, leverage our offshore uh, folks uh, for, for, for uh, most of these engagements as well. So, yep, that is my answer. Yeah. And, and, um, and there's, you know, helping uh, the use, you know, it's interesting. Uh, some previous companies that I, I've been a part of, have also have have we've had to tell people what to use our product for, but uh, you know customers and users are um, always finding new ways on how Elasticsearch is is being used and new use cases. And there's there's not a vertical that's that's out there today that that are not using Elasticsearch in some capacity, whether it be for you know again I think that's a, a great example in Ardipa from a financial institution um, to uh, health. Uh, healthcare, you know, there's a lot of people, even from a research standpoint, using Elasticsearch to, uh, you know, fast search over uh, data that's, uh, you know, that, uh, over medical data, right? Yep. Or the, you know, there's there's so many different verticals. So, I mean, if you're hearing a lot about, you know, financial institution and so forth, I think that's Nardeep's um, personal experience, but I've helped across, you know, public and private sector um, and, and all verticals. So I think 
the use cases are really not, not um, specific to observability, right? And I think that kind of really goes into the next question, which is also where do you see elastic five years and what's the, 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 the main driving motivation? So, you know, when, when Shai, our CEO, he's the creator of Elasticsearch, um, you know, created this, he wanted to create a search company. And if you think about search, it's, a, it's omnipresent in all of our lives. You know, there's not a day when you, you're not somewhere in a search box somewhere. And if you think about that, um, where, you know, you know, the only place where Elasticsearch is not at is that web browser, right? The, we're not, you know, going to be a web browser and search the, the entire uh, internet for that. But if you think about it, we're a, a search engine. And, and if you're trying to search for an answer, whether it be, uh, you know, looking at the, a restaurant, you know, using Yelp, you know, they use Elasticsearch behind the scenes and you're filtering data. What's the closest restaurant to me that's open, that happens to be Chinese food and that takes credit cards? You know, that type of search is, is, is something that's, that's available to everyone. And if you're using a, a ride share, uh, when you're looking at maps, uh, data and uh, analytics, you know, you're looking at that, um, that's also search. Um, and geospatial data, right? That's uh, Elasticsearch is providing that search to, uh, you know, say Uber. Um, you know, it's funny, you know, Tinder, if you're looking for love somewhere, they're using Elasticsearch to kind of bring those, those that love algorithm and, and bringing two people together. And observability, there's a lot of companies using it for, uh, you know, and you probably hear us more often for observability use cases. And now for security use cases, we have, as a 7.2, we released a free and open SIM, security SIM. And a lot of that machine learning really has that, that ties into that. So I, I think when you start to look at some of the um, five years out, you know, Shai has really built Elastic as a search company. So you think about search and you think about, you know, what is applicable to search, you know, we want to be there. And that very well could be in, um, you know, speech recognition or, or that could be in, um, you know, uh, searching for, for, for medical advice or breaching searches and understanding searches. So I think the possibilities is really, and the use cases are really endless because we're all searching for, for something at some point in, in the day. And I think with that, we are at time as well. Absolutely. So Nardeep, thanks for having me um, on with, uh, you know, for this, uh, and allowing me to showcase some of the observability. And I think it's something that you could easily, um, you, know, you know, download and, and uh, you know, as a container or as a VM, you know, or just as a Java process, download and install Elasticsearch and have Kibana, the open source side, and then start to play with some of the data sets and really, um, and, and see if it's, if it's gonna be a value to you. Um, there's a lot of data out there, you know, during this, this uh, pandemic too, we have a lot of, free online uh, training resources, you can go on and, and learn more. And of course, working with, with Cap Gemini on a lot of different, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, customers specific implementations or problem statements or anything else, we're, we're definitely happy to, to work with, uh, you know, with them and, and everyone else on, on your customers as well. Thank you, George. Uh, really appreciate your time. And, and again, a big uh, thank you to everyone uh, uh, from the attendee list. Uh, thanks to, you know, those who could make it live. Uh, for those who couldn't, of course, uh, there's, there's a recording that uh, we can go through. All right. Thank you. And uh, stay safe, everyone.